Um, it's my honor uh, to share our experience with the international colleagues uh, for the theme of uh, globalization, job market, and university education for others. As you know, after world economic crisis, uh, at the national level, uh, interested how to the learning or education respond to those kind of uh, uh, social economic uh, environmental change. It's not only uh, the Korean or Asian problem, but also uh, the European and uh, uh, United States. Even the outside is very beautiful day. Uh, it's uh, autumn color and the traditional uh, seasons in Korea. Uh, everybody just uh, enjoy the picnic, uh, all uh, the uh, four seasons. Um, we just uh, share what's going on uh, the related to uh, the roles of uh, higher education uh, to respond to those kind of uh, changes uh, related to uh, the job market. Uh, we just invite uh, three presenters from uh, international organization and United Kingdom and United uh, States. Uh, let me uh, introduce three uh, presenters. Uh, just besides with me is the president of SUNY uh, Empire State College, Dr. Uh, Melody Hancock. And, and the second is the Dr. Bibian Jones, who is the vice uh, president uh, for students' education at the University of Leeds, England. And the uh, last one is Dr. Living Wang from uh, UNESCO, uh, the Bangkok. Uh, the presentation will be uh, given uh, consecutively uh, without uh, an intermission. And uh, each presentation will be uh, last 20 minutes and uh, uh, let you know five minutes before uh, your finishing time. And after all the presentations are uh, uh, finished, uh, we will have the questions from the audience and uh, during uh, the presentations, if you have uh, uh, any questions, uh, just note, we already disseminate some your question uh, memo uh, papers. Uh, it's okay uh, to write your questions in, in English or in Korean. So why don't you give a big claps for all the presenters? Good afternoon. Today's discussion, and as I look at diverse talent in changing societies as an overall theme, is so appropriate around the world. As, as we heard yesterday, the issues that any one country is facing, I don't know if this is inspirational or concerning, but we're all sharing the same, the same issues around a changing workforce. So I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about what's happening in the US, in the state of New York, and then how Empire State College is trying to address that, what we're doing, what our challenges are, and, and how it's working for us. The scenario in the US is probably much like around the world. We've seen a large shift from the production to the knowledge-based economy in areas such as the Rust Belt, Detroit, where generations of families have made their living without an education beyond high school in areas that are now irrelevant. They're having to be retrained. They're having to think about education in ways they never have. We have a tremendous number of what we call first generation college students, meaning they're the first person in their family to ever consider and go to college. We've had a protracted period of little or no domestic job growth. So while the job market is changing from production to knowledge based, there's also not a lot of new opportunities. The opportunities that do exist are increasingly with transnational employers. In the United States, our students and our children don't grow up in a bilingual language. They don't grow up facing multinational cultures and experiences on a daily basis. So this is a tremendous handicap for the average American student. The higher education environment is a little bit reversed from how I understand it is in Korea. Our student, our population over 35 has one of the highest degree attainment levels in the world. But for our generation under 35, we're now down to 18th in the world for degree attainment. As you can imagine, the US is not particularly proud about that. And President Obama has made a significant effort to say we need to change that. 
We've seen an escalation in the cost of attain, attending college as state and federal support has shrunk for colleges and students have had to bear more and more of the cost of going to college. We've also seen an increase in non-traditional and adult students. In the United States, we consider a traditional student a student who leaves secondary education and goes straight into full-time study at a college. Just to get a sense of the room, can I find out, is there anyone in the room that did not go straight to college after finishing secondary education? So here's a little bit of the problem. We're the educators. Let me ask one more question. Is there anyone in the room who took their college degree either online or through other non-traditional means? So here's a bit of the challenge. We're the educators, and by the way, I'm right with you. We're the educators, and we're trying to educate a population that we do not know and we didn't live through. And by the way, if you're a professor, you learn that skill by going to college, by going to school. There's not, you learn it on the job. So in New York, we look a lot like the rest of the country, but we have a population of about 20 million. Much like a lot of the states and maybe um, a lot of the countries, we're the fourth most populous state in the US, and we have the largest city in the US, New York City, and if you say New York, everybody just assumes you're from the city. So nine million of our 20 million uh, residents live in New York City. So we have a highly dense area, and then the rest is very sparse. We cover about 55,000 square miles, making us average size for a state in the United States. We have a highly diverse population, particularly around the boroughs of New York City. We have a decreasing traditional high school age student cohort. This is happening across the United States. As we've gone through, we had the baby boom that came out of World War II. Then we had the baby boom echo as the baby boomers babies came through college. Now we're seeing a falling down again. So we have fewer college, traditional age college students coming out in the next five years. We have a large public higher education across the state of New York. And we have a lot of room to improve. New York's not in bad shape, but New York likes to be best at, and first at everything in the United States. So we know we have a lot of room to improve. We have about 5.5 million people who have a high school diploma but do not have a bachelor's degree. Of those, 17% of the population has some college but no degree. So only 45% of our adults have a college degree. And go back to the very first bullet on the first slide, we are increasingly a knowledge-based economy. So the Empire State College Challenge. We've been challenged to create an opportunity for students who do not take a traditional college pathway, those students who do not leave high school and go to college full time. With that, we've been told we need to successfully recruit, retain, and prepare an older or non-traditional student body for today's global workforce, and here's a couple of the challenges. We need to lower the cost to the student and to the state of New York. We need to make sure that our education provides immediate and long-term professional value. We need accessibility regardless of time and location. Our students are working, they're caring for the generations above them and the generations below them. They have a lot of commitments and they have to work their, high school or their college education around that. We need consistent learning outcomes. Employers need to be able to count on our degrees and know what they mean. And we need to be in compliance with state, national, and crediting regulations and standards. In the United States, we've had issues with some bad players, particularly in the for-profit market. And we need to be very, very careful that students who come through our programs get a degree they can count on and it has a strong reputation. So we have a lot of regulation in the United States trying to make sure that all schools are high quality. The founding philosophy of Empire State College helps us. We were founded in 1971 to be a unique college with the belief that education should transcend conven conventional academic structure, meaning we're a lot more nimble than most US institutions. It should respect various forms of college level learning. It should promote experimental delivery modes. Learning should be student-centric, and this is where I like the diverse talent. Each of our students starts at a unique place. We need to know where that is. Because they're non-traditional, they all bring a body of knowledge to the classroom that's much different than a traditional 18-year-old. 
And we believe that lifelong education is inherent in workforce development, social equity, and community health. The college has a very strong culture of improving the human condition, and that informs quite a bit of what we do and the type of students we attract. Just looking at the foundation of what we do, we try to balance tradition with innovation. We're fortunate in that we were set up to be innovative. Our faculty are mentors. They work very, very closely with the students. We have traditional full-time faculty, but they work one-on-one -on -one with our students quite a bit. We do a tremendous amount of prior learning assessment. Some people think of prior learning assessment as just credit for work experience. It's far more difficult than that. It takes quite a bit of documentation, quite a bit of assessing. However, if you have a 30-year-old student who has been quite interested in history and has read numerous history books, gone to very various field trips around different historical relevant uh, locations, maybe done reenactments, that person certainly has more understanding of that perspective of history, say U.S. history, than they would in an entry-level history class. So if they can prove that learning, we're willing to give them the credit for them that rather than having them retake it just to say they took it in a class. We use a variety of delivery options. We have our traditional online classes, which about maybe 40 to 50% of our students like to take. We have traditional classroom classes, as you would think about. We have small group studies. The one thing we do not have is large lectures. Because we are student-centric, large lectures don't work for our approach. So you'll never find a class with Empire State College with over about 30 students. And most of our classes are far smaller. We believe in making learning matter. Most of our students have already started education somewhere else and didn't complete. That or opted not to go there straight out of high school. We need to keep it relevant to the student. Our students largely architect their degree plans and have to write a justification or a rationale on how it works together for a cohesive body of learning. That investment from the student right up front is critical. We provide student success coaching. Our students have been out of the study mode for a long time. They need to learn time management. They need to remember what it's like to study. They need to get over their fear of doing the first research paper. And for us, our students' first research paper will take them about 10 times as long as their last research paper, just because they've been out of the process for so long. And we have to have relevant and creative curriculum. We want to make sure that what we do really matters to the learners of today and the employers of today. So that's what we're doing. And here's where we're growing. We're trying to create geographically linked classes. Right now, we're doing it around the state. We have a lot of great technology that can bring a professor from one area into the state into a classroom of students somewhere else. We hope to fill that in farther, and you'll see that in a moment. We're looking at competency-based education. In the United States, we have some experimental sites that our Department of Education has given permission to, to work with. Empire State College is one of those schools. We're learning as we go with that. Competency-based education is a little bit like prior learning, but it's more for the student who doesn't exactly have college-level learning. Maybe they have a lot of experience, but they haven't quite progressed it to college-level learning. Competency-based edu education lets a student work at their own pace to fill in the learning and meet those requirements. We use it as a piece of what our students take. Our students don't do their degrees fully by prior learning or by competency-based, but we do believe there may be some areas that this can help them expedite their education. We're building open educational resources. Non-traditional students tend to be tight on money, and when, the first thing they will do is they will bypass their textbooks and support materials. In the United States, these books often can cost as much, if not more, than tuition. Open educational resources ensures that all of our students have the same learning opportunities and learning materials. Communities of impact. In the United States, we have communities of interest that we speak about. Our students are adult students. They're into community development. They're into their professions. We look at communities of impact. What they do works right now. If they're doing a project on um, community gardening to create economic independence for refugees in upstate New York, it has impact right now. We want to tie those communities together and get the largest effect of that student faculty research and work as we can. 
Here's the tough part in the United States. We're working hard to balance professional and liberal arts exposure. We want to make very, very sure our graduates have skills that are readily available for the job immediately. However, and we heard this a little bit yesterday, we also want to make sure that our graduates are ready for the changing world. And that tends to be more of a liberal arts education. So we work very hard to make sure we keep the balance of both. They're skilled in the job skills they need now, and they have that strong liberal arts education that will help them move up and change jobs as the economy in the workplace develops. Global appreciation, understanding, and problem solving. This, as I stated earlier, is a challenge in the US. We have to keep it across the curriculum and repeatedly expose it. So I'm going to go back to the first bullet on geographically linked classes and global appreciation, understanding, and problem solving. Part of our solution, because our students are working, they can't do a semester or a year abroad, we need to basically link learning from here, and this is when most people think New York. These are the five boroughs of New York City. Right now, we use video conferencing and other virtual tools to bring these communities together. We're now building out, this is all of New York State, how to bring faculty and students across New York State, around the country, and repeatedly around the world to meet with students in other environments. So a money and banking student in New York may repeatedly come up with money and banking students, not necessarily in a joint program, but over interaction with jointly taught classes, students from around the world, in other societies, other um, economic countries, they can see different exposures. By doing this throughout the student's curriculum, they'll start to appreciate much more of the global cultures, global trends, and global nuances of their own discipline. So basically, we're trying to go from using this, which are what our average New Yorkers look like. Our students tend to have served in the military. They obviously have a high school diploma. They're working, they're parents. But where we need to get them is to this. And I realize you can't read this, but what this is is a skills gap for New York looking forward. At the top are the healthcare industries, and that's where we project the biggest delta in skills. At the bottom are office and administrative support and sales and those areas. Unfortunately, third from the bottom is education, training, and library. because That's in New York where we will have the least need for students and workers. So we need to take the people on the previous slide who have very busy lives, who have moved on without a traditional education and help get them prepared to move into these job needs that New York is facing in the future. So real quickly, how are we doing? We serve just over 19,000 students each year. We have nearly 75,000 alums. We have about 50% of our students take advantage of prior learning. They bring in an average of 23 credits. And I should say our average student is 35. So it's hard for a 20-year-old to bring in much in college-level prior learning. But for a 35-year-old, they've done a fair amount of college-level learning throughout their life. That saves the average student almost $6,000 in obtaining their college degree. We have solid postgraduate earnings. 43% of our graduates earn more than $50,000 a year, and in the United States, that's good money. 44% have a household income of 80% or more. And in the United States, having students work within their discipline is a key issue, and the majority of our students go to work within their disciplines. The other piece within the United States is education has become increasingly expensive. Students tend to pay for it with loans. And that's become an issue as students can't get jobs after they graduate, they default on loans. So the United States has started looking very closely at that. Empire State College has a loan default rate at nearly half of the national rate, which puts us in very good shape with the Department of Education, but it also means that the bulk of our students are walking right into jobs, they're able to pay back their loans, and they're seeing a very positive return on their investment. And probably most importantly, the State University of New York is a very, very large system, and Empire State College consistently rates number one in student satisfaction surveys. So we're doing pretty well, we've got a lot to go with, and a lot to learn, and a lot to do, but that's where we are, thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and could I just say what a delight it is to be here. 
This is my first uh, visit to Korea, and I've been here for almost a week, um, and I've learned already a great deal um, from the people from educational institutions in Korea that I've had the privilege of speaking to, and I have very much enjoyed the beauty of the city of Seoul too. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, my name, as you can see, is Vivian Jones, and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor, that is the equivalent of a Vice President, responsible at the University of Leeds in the UK for student education. And one of the areas, therefore, that I'm responsible for is lifelong learning. I should say I'm not myself an expert in lifelong learning, but I am deeply committed to lifelong learning, as is my institution. Just a little bit about the national context before I say more about Leeds. In the UK, about 45% of students from, uh, immediately from school and college now go into higher education. I know that's a good deal lower than the number here in Korea, but it still represents a huge increase in UK terms. But we are still very bad indeed at um, being successful and encouraging adult learners and part-time learners into the higher education system. And I'm very sorry to say that over the past few years, since we introduced uh, a new funding system for undergraduate students uh, in the UK, um, students take on loans of £9,000 a year, um, that has meant that there has been an extremely high drop in the number of adult learners, which was already, as I say, a low total coming through into higher education, something like a 40% drop in adult applicants to higher education. I'm pleased to say that we have not experienced that at Leeds, but I should also be quite clear and say that our number of adult learners is not high, because Leeds is a research-intensive institution. Um, it's a member of the Russell Group um, of in research-intensive institutions. So we are a very different kind of institution from the one that Meridi represents. And it might be interesting to you to hear about some of our experiences and principles in thinking about lifelong learning at a university like mine. So just to say a little bit more about the University of Leeds to give you a bit of context. This is a statement from our strategic plan that we're committed, like many other um, institutions of higher education, to the dis dissemination and application of knowledge and that that will remain at the heart of all we do and it builds on the university's history and traditions. One of the uh, areas of tradition and value um, commitment that the University of Leeds has always held to is the principle that we should make our education available to students if they can benefit from it, whatever background they come from. Quite a lot of that, what we call widening participation activity, um, is uh, with 18-year-olds who come from disadvantaged social backgrounds and we provide encouragement to them during their time at school, we provide scholarships to them and we support them when they come through to the university to make sure as best we can that they achieve at the same level as their more advantaged um, peers. But it also means that we are committed to encouraging as many adult learners and part-time learners to come through to the university as we can. So we have a, a dual-pronged widening participation strategy. But that is in the context of a university which, as I say, is research intensive. We are in the top 100 in the QS rankings. We have 31,000 students, most of whom are standard 18-year-olds. Um, we are in the top nine for research impact. So those are some of the key distinguishing factors in Leeds. And against that background, we are seeking very actively to make sure that adult learners who can benefit from the education, the research-based education we offer, um, can do so. I should also say, because I have responsibility for student education, and it is, of course, extremely important to me, that we do pretty well on student satisfaction. 90% of our students um, in the annual national student survey, which asks students when they are leaving how they felt about their education, 90% of our students have been satisfied or very satisfied with their Leeds education, and 92% have been satisfied or very satisfied with the quality of the teaching that they have received. So we have a good basis on which to encourage adult learners into the university. And what I'm going to be um, saying uh, in the few minutes that I have this afternoon is that although we are facing lots of changing um, 
um, a, a largely a, a changing environment into which students are um, entering both at university and beyond. There are certain things too that remain, I think, common to a sense of what higher education is about. And you will see that some of the principles that I'm going to be talking about resonate very clearly with some of the things that Meredy was saying. So I want to talk about three areas which seem to me key when we're thinking about lifelong learning. Relevance, flexibility, and community. Relevance, because we must be sure that what we are offering to our adult learners is relevant to their needs. Both the needs as they are felt in their complicated lives, as we've already heard, and also the needs as we try and prepare them to go out into this complex world, this globalized world, confidently, along with their bright, confident 18-year-old co-students. We have to be flexible because they have complicated lives, so they need to be, we need to be flexible about the mode, time, and place of study that we offer to them. And we have to think about the community of learning that we offer to adult learners, many of whom are much less confident, as I've already suggested, than their 18-year-old peer group. So let me look at some of these in a bit more detail. Taking relevance, first of all. We need to introduce our adult learners, no less than our 18-year-old students, we need to introduce them to the kinds of questions that uh, need to be answered in contemporary society. Sometimes that will mean changing professional and technological agendas, and some of them will be coming through already from areas of work where they will want to be uh, updated, upskilled, and given the opportunity to uh, move on within their already chosen professional area. Some of them, of course, will be coming in order to get a handle and get on the ladder of professional development. Um, and we need to develop them as lifelong learners so that when they come to us as adult learners, we are not only, as it were, labeling them as lifelong learners because they're older than most students, but we're teaching them to become lifelong learners for the rest of their lives. And one of the ways in th which we encourage um, students to think at Leeds because of our research intensity, we're a very large, comprehensive university, is in interdisciplinary ways so that we can introduce them to that culture of knowledge creation across the ways in which um, disciplines can actually productively interact in the face of global problems. This is just a, a list, most universities will have a similar list of the way in which Leeds has defined the global challenges that it is approaching in interdisciplinary ways. Food, food security, food production, water, water conservation and management, healthcare, global healthcare, energy, energy conserving um, and developing new energy resources, the particular problems of sustainable cities, the way in which culture um, can interact with and provide all kinds of key insights into the ways in which we think about technological problems, and then the high um, uh, value engineering, which complements those cultural questions to, to uh, provide us with technical solutions. And sometimes lifelong learners will be coming back from, as I say, from professional backgrounds to get reskilled, to have their horizons opened intellectually, to think in new ways about the areas of activity they're already working in, but where they, by thinking in an interdisciplinary way, they may well uh, come up with new solutions in their area of activity. But those are the highly qualified already usually professionals. And of course, we offer that kind of continuing professional development for those kind of people. But they're not the people that I'm mainly wanting to focus on. I want to move to my second uh, heading, which is that of flexibility, that we should be opening higher education um, of that interdisciplinary problem-solving kind to all adult learners who uh, want to benefit from it. And there we have to think about the ways in which, within an institution, we are agile about the ways in which we respond to learner choices and needs, the what of what they want to learn, the how of how they're going to learn it, the when of when they are going to learn it, and the where of where they are going to learn it. So what I've already talked about in terms of the kinds of um, relevance uh, that we would hope to offer to our students in terms of a, a professional interdisciplinary uh, research-based um, context. 
But the how is I need to pause on for a, a little longer because the how is about the kinds of pedagogic approaches that both respect the experience of adult learners, as we have already heard, um, but also um, help them gain confidence because many of them come through and are absolutely not confident in spite of the kinds of experiential knowledge that they bring. In a higher education environment, they don't understand the value necessarily of what of the experience that they do bring. And one of the things we have to do is find ways of teaching them that actually bring out um, the confidence that we hope to send them away from the university with eventually. It also is a question, of course, the how is also a question about technology and the ways in which we can use technology creatively to help with that second, or that third question, rather, of the when, so that students can learn more flexibly at whatever time of the day or week um, suits them because of their other commitments, and indeed of the where, where some of their work can increasingly, of course, be done at home or indeed at a distance. Leeds is not a distance learning. We do some distance learning, but we're not a specialist in distance learning, but we are developing those opportunities. But the where of um, the opportunity to do distance learning. But one of the points I want to make here is the importance of face-to-face -face work. Education, it seems to me, is fundamentally about human beings interacting with each other, sparking off each other, and getting ideas from each other. And that is most readily done when people come together in groups to talk to each other. That can be done quite effectively across the internet, but the complementarity of um, internet uh, uh, availability and face-to-face -face education is something I think is very important, and certainly something we emphasize at Leeds. But just thinking about the how, we do, as I say, now um, do quite a bit of di digital delivery. We are a member of a UK-based uh, MOOC platform, Future Learn, which was set up by the Open University, which some of you will know is a long-standing distance learning uh, university in the UK. It goes back to the 1970s, so they had a lot of expertise to bring to bear. And the slide just gives you one example of quite a lot of MOOCs we've now produced at Leeds, which is about the ethics of global development. Um, it's run by one of our leading professors in our School of Geography. It's called, as you can see, Fairness and Nature When Worlds Collide. And here, um, we have found that students have been taking that MOOC not only in areas of the UK, of course, where they have not traditionally been coming through to education, but globally. We heard yesterday, some of you might have heard the very inspiring talk by John Sexton from, the, uh, from NYU, where they have a university of the people, as he called it, where the widening participation activity, as I would call it, is actually international and global. And that's one of the things that MOOCs can introduce, uh, I think, is that um, global aspect of, um, of widening participation and lifelong learning. And that's something that in our beginning uh, to produce MOOCs at the University of Leeds, we have found to be already quite effective. Just to move on to community, and here I think three key um, aspects, three key principles obtain. That we should be working on a basis of partnership with our students. A partnership between staff and students, and indeed between students and students, so that they teach each other. That we offer them a supportive learning environment, and that one of our other partnerships is with external communities. We do a lot of work at Leeds, working with the local community, with community groups uh, externally in the city region. Um, going out to talk to them, to encourage students to work with them so that students gain the confidence to even apply to the University of Leeds in the first place. Because sometimes we look off-putting to students who have not had um, a, a family tradition in education. And one of the ways that we bring these principles together at the University of Leeds is through our Lifelong Learning Centre. We have made a very conscious investment in a dedicated specialist unit, which is very rare, actually, in research-intensive universities in the UK, that 
is dedicated to precisely this effort to bring in adult part-time learners into the university. And they have staff who understand the skills development needs and the community of learning kinds of needs and the confidence building kinds of needs that those particular students have. And they offer a variety of kinds of courses, in, uh, foundation courses, so that students who want to move through to do a degree in the university in one of its faculties can do so. They offer degrees themselves of a variety of kinds so that students can stay within the lifelong learning environment if that's what they want to do. And they offer a whole range of taster um, programs so that students who are thinking about coming, and again, as I say, need to be helped to gain the confidence to apply, can start to think about doing so. So it's that investment, I think, um, in, as I say, uh, a, a research-intensive university that has meant that we have been able, I'm very proud to say, to book the national trend and have a continuing number of students coming through as adult part-time learners at Leeds. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share with you some of our ideas and the works uh, from UNESCO Bangkok office. Um, actually, um, I think lifelong learning is uh, under uh, the responsibility of my unit. I'm working in UNESCO Bangkok office uh, in charge of uh, higher education, TVET, uh, teacher education, uh, ICT education, and also education for sustainable development. This is under the responsibility of our unit. And uh, I just want to give you a very uh, simple presentation uh, to highlight some of our, of our ideas and also the work that's, that is going on um, about uh, uh, lifelong learning and the, the way uh, higher education institutions should adapt to the changing needs of the society. Lifelong learning concept is very simple. It's just one need us to have a holistic approach to, lear to learning. And uh, since the introduction of modern education system, we saw the whole system has been separated into different levels and the types of education institutions under different departments within the ministry. And uh, all these kind of, uh, 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 you know, uh, different levels and types of education, they are not working together, even within the ministry which means actually they are not connected. And they are not connected under the principle of lifelong learning. And the principle of lifelong learning is also not new to us. It's been around for almost a century. In the 1960s in Europe, there was a movement of uh, lifelong education, which was leading to the public publication of a very important UNESCO book called An Introduction to Lifelong Learning. Uh, actually, UNESCO is, uh, uh, has been advocating for lifelong education for a long time. And uh, later, uh, we think that we should put students at the center of learning, So, which means we change lifelong learning to life, uh, lifelong education to lifelong learning to reflect the needs to put students first. And the learning can actually happen and, and actually required throughout a person's life. This is not a new concept. Uh, but unfortunately, um, the concept of lifelong learning has had only been discussed among the academia for a long time until some of the governments really take substantial steps to embed these kind of principles in, into their education policies. Uh, we can see a, very a lot of successful uh, examples in the European countries. And the Korea is perhaps the first country to introduce a specific act for lifelong education in 2007, if I'm not mistaken. And the NIO is actually the, the, the institutional response to, to the 
uh, uh, Lifelong Learning Act, which, are, were, which was introduced in 2007. So we really admire the government of Korea in introducing lifelong learning as an overarching values and principles. But for many other countries, it's only on paper, even for Asia Pacific in, in, in this region. So um, I would like to uh, actually share with you some of the meanings of lifelong learning for our education system. In terms of content, it's very clear that we need to develop proper learning metrics to reflect generic knowledge, professional competencies, to inform curriculum development in a sustainable and a dynamic manner. And I realize that in Korea, you are very good in developing these occupational quality standards. And you are also in the process of thinking of developing a kind of national qualifications framework. This is very essential in implementing this uh, 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 principle of uh, uh, lifelong learning. In terms of modality, it's also diversified. The conventional modality will be to based on classroom teaching, face-to-face -face classroom teaching. But now we saw increasing use of technology in the form of blended learning and the MOOCs, uh, massive open online courses, and also ODL, which UNESCO is very keen to promote, uh, the increasing use of, uh, of technology. But I have to say that in this part of the world, governments and the universities do not trust any programs delivered online because they are worried about the quality. So that's why UNESCO now is working uh, towards the development of uh, proper quality assurance mechanisms for online learning. And also, learning can happen not only in education institutions, it can, it can happen at home. Or also in community and also at workplace. So this can be uh, very flexible and uh, of course the beneficiaries of learning is no longer only focusing on school age le learners. Uh, we need to address the needs of more uh, adult learners. So that's I think we need to know about uh, under the principle of lifelong learning. Um, so uh, as part of, of the education system, uh, higher education needs to align itself into the principle of lifelong learning. And uh, we need to not only targeting school leavers, but also to serve adult learners to provide continuing and the professional development programs. Uh, it also applies to university curriculum and the pedagogy also to promote lifelong learning. We need to develop a kind of flexible entry and exit points for adult learners. And we should also uh, need to make more use of technology in the delivery of programs like MOOCs, blended learning, and open educational resources. So um, another area I would like to share with you is, is really the impact of uh, higher education massification and the aging society. In Korea, it's also very unique that you have the world highest gross enrollment ratio in higher education. Everybody can go to university. Your G gross enrollment ratio to university is even higher than the United States. You are more than 90%. And the ex expanded higher education system should be supported by differentiation of functions among diverse types of higher education institutions. If you have a look at the, at the experiences in the UK in the 1960s, the expansion only involved the expansion of uh, polytechnics, which are more technical in nature and all more 
employment uh, uh, driven. And then later in 1990s, all the polytechnics get the university st uh, status. And uh, the expansion should be the expansion of non-university higher education sector. So that's why uh, we would like to propose that actually in terms of uh, program, we need to go for more professional and high vocational programs rather than traditional academic oriented programs. Uh, this is also uh, very uh, useful to promote the relevance of the program, higher education program, and also to reduce the youth unemployment and the skills mismatch. Uh, another thing I, I would like to share with you is the idea of three pillars for university teaching service. You, we all have undergraduate program and a postgraduate program. But we should also think of developing a very strong continuing and the professional development program, targeting adult learners. This is due to the aging population, because we are getting less and less uh, uh, students uh, who are in a uh, uh, university age, and the more adult students actually uh, is, uh, is in, you know, um, is coming. And, um, and uh, this is uh, uh, the third pillar for all universities uh, to, to expand. But uh, traditionally, uh, for many universities, this uh, kind of uh, continuing and professional development, it's only uh, regarded as an additional function to the teaching, research, and the social service. But it's getting more and more important now. Um, another thing I think is quite important is uh, developing national qualification framework. If we want to really establish a lifelong learning society. And the uh, NQF was originated in the United Kingdom and was followed by many Commonwealth countries. In countries like Japan, Korea, and China, we do not have this kind of tradition. But now, it's increasingly important that we need to think of a common uh, 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 framework to benchmark different kinds of uh, qualifications. And you can see from this uh, uh, diagram that uh, normally NQF covers programs starting at the post compulsory education level uh, through TVET and higher education. And uh, at the school level, normally it's covered by national curriculum standards. So this is a very key issue, I think, to make all the programs vertically and horizontally coherent. Uh, during the process, we can engage all the stakeholders to make sure that all the criteria are internally and externally coherent in terms of content. And it's only with this kind of framework that all types and forms of learning can be recognized. And then it's clearly help contributing to the estab establishment of a lifelong learning society. Um, in terms of undergraduate program, I think it's also very important that uh, we need to align all the program with uh, this institutional um, subject specific quality standards. And once again, I would like to strongly propose the development of NQF. Um, and we also should also think of uh, the distribution of general education courses plus professional orientation courses, which the United States have a long tradition of liberal arts uh, 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 courses, uh, programs. But we need to think of how to, you know, combine these two elements. Blended learning is also very important. We need to encourage, you know, professors to make more use of technology. And in the case of Australia, actually, in many of the universities, a program Maybe 70% was delivered online, and 
was delivered uh, in the trade conventional classroom uh, settings. This is really uh, very revolutionary. And uh, also, uh, I think it's also very important to make more use of uh, MOOCs uh, for, to benefit more uh, students, even adult learners. MOOCs is very expensive. It's only country like Korea can afford to develop this kind of key MOOCs. You already have 27 uh, courses, very expensive. And we really admire the government of Korea to invest so much on this common platform. And this key MOOCs actually can provide this common quality assurance mechanism for all programs to be included in this platform. Um, Postgraduate program is also the same. We need to stick to the institutional, national, and the international quality standards. I know in Korea, you already get so national university cooperatized, which means they can operate independently, right? Then the government said, we, we already lost our control to so national university. No. Actually, you have the funding mechanism. In the case of the UK, they traditionally have a very decentralized system, focusing on institutional autonomy and the academic freedom. But now, they have a very strong quality assurance agencies. They developed a kind of common academic infrastructure. Every university has to align all their programs with these national standards, otherwise, they cannot get the money from the government. So I think this is a kind of uh, institutional autonomy which are regulated by, by uh, national standards. Uh, and I think it's also very important for pro postgraduate uh, program uh, to be more professional oriented, market driven, and of course engagement of the, all the stakeholders are very important. Um, and the, the use of, uh, of, uh, of uh, online, offline, and the blended learning uh, modalities. Uh, and also important is the opportunity for people to benefit from courses, which may be based on self-interests, uh, uh, which will not lead to certification. Um, the third pillar is continuing in the professional development. This is increasingly important. It's not second, second level service. And it's very important for uh, higher education institutions. It can also be uh, one of the important income generation activities for higher education institutions. And the use of open and distance learning and OER is highly encouraged. Um, so it, it needs to be close to the needs of the adult ed, uh, learners. Of course, teachers need to be ready. University professors are sometimes not that quick in adapting themselves to the new needs of the, of the society. And I think the, the mentality needs to be changed also. And I think professors are not the only owner of the university because you are publicly financed, you are paid by the, uh, the, uh, the tuition fee. There's a lot of other stakeholders. So this kind of mentality uh, should be changed and also university culture in favor of lifelong learning. Um, we also suggest that also capacity building is also needed for university staff to take multiple tasks, such as teaching, research, and the social service. And also, uh, so distinguish, uh, distinguishing between university uh, teaching uh, professors and the school teachers is that university professors do not do much pedagogical research. They are doing research on content. But school teachers are more active and more required 
to do pedagogical research. So that's the difference. Both should be research-based, but school teachers are more based on pedagogical research rather than content research. But university professors, they are good in creating new knowledge. But they are sometimes not very good in transmitting, you know, delivering the new knowledge to, to the students. So I think it's also very important that we need to encourage a more capacity building in the program development, pedagogical innovation, and also the more use of ICT. Uh, we also need universities to provide institutional incentives to support mechanism, uh, and, and supporting mechanisms to encourage this uh, mentality change and the university culture to, to take shape. Uh, and also we need also infrastructure development. Um, and also um, open and distance learning and open educational resources, which are two priority areas for UNESCO. And um, I think quality assurance is also very important. Um, we need to try more of the branded learning and uh, also to try to develop more MOOCs at the institutional level or collected with collected collective efforts. Um, Lastly, I would like to introduce you uh, some of our ongoing project. Actually, it's two, two ongoing projects. One is to build the capacity of higher education institutions in Asia and the Pacific for blended learning. It's relatively new for us, but it's not that new for universities in Australia. And we are a little bit conservative, actually, when it comes to, to the use of uh, of technology. We need to encourage uh, more courses to be taught online. And we are also doing regional stock taking exercise to collect the best policies and the practices on the development and the implementation of MOOCs. And uh, we are going to do something on open educational resources, OER policies for higher education. And uh, now we are in the end at the end of this current biennium. Next January, we are going to develop new proposals, and uh, we very much hope that we can develop a, 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 a regional uh, project on OER. Um, thank you very much for, for your attention. Uh, thanks for uh, the all presenters and uh, uh, three of them uh, especially introduced their experience with non-traditional students uh, uh, from uh, their university. Uh, Dr. Hancock mentioned about how uh, they successfully uh, uh, manage the students, uh, especially uh, non-traditional students. Uh, with the uh, Empire, SUNY Empire State College. They have 95% uh, of students uh, among uh, 20,000 is a non-traditional students and the number one and most uh, uh, preferred and satisfied uh, of their educational the quality. So she just introduced uh, their experience and uh, uh, Dr. Jones talking about the uh, adult uh, learners uh, based on their uh, campus, the University of Leeds in United Kingdom. And uh, she uh, just, just suggested uh, three uh, fundamental uh, principles, the relevance, uh, flexibility, and community uh, are very important uh, for their uh, uh, education for others, and she also mentioned uh, off the campus or online is important, but we have to consider about the uh, face-to-face, uh, the learning uh, for the interaction. The lastly, uh, Professor Wang mentioned about uh, the perspective of lifelong learning, the paradigms, and three, uh, undergraduate and the graduate level 
including the continuing education levels from um, the international organizations, what we have to make a connection uh, with those various kinds of systems uh, at the college levels. Uh, three of them uh, mentioned how to the university and higher education respond to those uh, needs from our society at this time, especially uh, the economic uh, the change and globalization, not only individual level, but also the community and national levels. Uh, actually, we have uh, uh, eight... Uh, questions from the audience, and uh, if you collect more, uh, please let me know. And uh, I already uh, disseminate uh, each uh, presenters, and I have uh, one, and the questions are uh, all of three common, and uh, the last, I will ask uh, this one, the last. And uh, are you ready, Hancock? Yes. question that asks about, as adult learners attend college classes, how do we assess their learning abilities? Mm -hmm. Is that on? Yeah. How do, we assess, <laughs> how do we assess their learning abilities, and are they ready to be in a class with the younger students? And the same about the curriculum. How do we adjust the curriculum? Adult students in the United States, our outcomes are our outcomes. They have to meet the same level of standards. But they come in, Dr. Jones spoke a little bit about confidence, and adult students tend to lack confidence. So that's a place where I think you do need to build them up a bit, whereas traditional students come in with a fair amount of confidence. They've just come out of high school. They're, um, they're confident in their abilities to study and succeed. So together, if you can mix the traditional and the non-traditional, or the older and the younger students together, it tends to be very good. Adult students, while they may not have the confidence in their study skills, and where they tend to need more work is in the writing, reacquainting them with academic writing skills and research skills. They bring a different level to the course discussion. They bring, uh, I'll give an example where I had with adult students where I, I, my background is economics and business, so I was teaching the Phillips curve. And if you happen to be an economist, it's a very simple philosophy or a simple theory that states you can have unemployment or inflation. So I was teaching this to a group of older students, and they were living through a period of stagflation. So they knew quite well that that theory made no sense in real life. And that's a little bit of the difference when adult students come into a classroom. They don't let you get by with just the theory. They raise the bar on the discussion. They raise the bar on the justification for the faculty member. And oftentimes, they know more about a particular area than the faculty member. So rather than lowering the bar in the classroom and for the curriculum, they tend to actually raise the bar and raise the level of discussion. And the younger students become very intrigued, moving it from straight theory to the balance of theory and practice. Um, OK, so one of the questions to me was asking um, whether, b besides the Lifelong Learning Center at Leeds, whether Leeds University has any other kinds of system that help non-traditional adults to get a degree or to take a course. Um, I think I wouldn't describe the other things we do as a system exactly, um, but I would say that what we like to do, um, what the Lifelong Learning Centre does, is work with our faculties um, to share that expertise with the faculty, and they provide specialist support for part-time adult learners wherever they are in the university. Sometimes part-time adult learners come through directly to our faculties, um, and they don't come through the Lifelong Learning Centre. And when they, um, when they enter the university in that way, the Lifelong Learning Centre shares responsibility for their skills development and their pastoral care with the faculty because they have those, well, one, because they have the particular understanding of what their needs might be, but two, because they can introduce those students then who sometimes are quite isolated within their course um, to other adult learners and they can help with that, um, with that community need, that community of learners. So that's one of the things that happens. We also at, um, have university policies that make sure that we don't discriminate in any way um, against people who have caring responsibilities or students, for example, who get pregnant while they're um, uh, with us. Um, 
particular issues, not just for um, adult learners, of course, but can affect adult learners more than 18-year-olds. So there are policies in place to make sure that we deal with them equitably in those kinds of situations. There are Leeds University Students' Union has a mature student society, which also provides a, a community support for them. Um, and we also do our best to provide mentors and both within the current student community, um, other adult learners, and uh, in alumni, um, adult learners who've gone through the university and then can bring back their experiences and help current students. So they're not exactly systems, but they are attempts to make um, the environment as inviting as possible. Thank you very much. I got a question about uh, in aging society, how lifelong learning at uh, the university will be effective and efficient. What's their role? Actually, I think uh, basically now university has uh, three basic functions, teaching, research, and social service, right? Then actually, um, within these three functions, we need to have uh, elements uh, targeting these adult learners and even the, the, the elderly people. For example, in, in, in teaching, we need to develop a kind of uh, program which are targeting uh, the needs of the adult learners. Uh, whatever it leads to the certification or not uh, non-certification. Um, so we need people in the university. Right to develop this kind of uh, uh, program, which are not very traditional. And, uh, and uh, uh, in the function of research, university play a very important role in leading the research on this aging society and its impact and on, on, on the economy. And it's be becoming an, an uh, important uh, uh, discipline of studies. So uh, this is also social service. Uh, universities may think of, uh, you know, developing some community engagement activities targeting elderly people. But normally, I think it's not only the responsibility of the universities. I think the local community, community college, you know, and uh, universities tend to be in a very high level. And I think uh, in dealing with the uh, aging society, uh, not only universities, but also other uh, private sector and also other civil societies and also other educational institutions. They all should have a role to play, but basically let's never forget these three functions of un universities and then to make it extended uh, to the needs of the elderly people, whatever it's in teaching or in research or in social engagement. Thank you very much. I'm going to try and combine somewhat two questions. I had a question on the recognition of prior learning. How is that recognized for credit? And then a somewhat similar question on a knowledge-based economy. How is the institution in which a student graduates from acknowledged in, in the job market? And in some ways, they're hooked. You have to be very careful when you step out of the traditional because most of the people who are doing the hiring came from a very traditional education. Empire State College, in much like Leeds, which is a research institution, we are a teaching institution. So that eases it a little bit. Our faculty do scholarship m more so than research. But our primary goal is truly bringing, bringing the disciplines to life to the students. So most of the scholarship centers around, around areas they're teaching and things they're doing. Recognition of prior learning has been a long-standing field in the U.S. It has about 40 years of history behind it. It is, it is not easy on the student, and it's very, very important that you follow a, a rigorous set of standards in evaluating how that credit is awarded, what the students have to do to prove the learning, and that it truly is college-level learning and not just workplace experience. So we make sure that we're very transparent in how we do it. We keep very strong records and portfolios on the students. And we've benefited that as Empire State College is considered one of the leaders in the US on prior learning. So the students do get credit for it, 
but it is through a very, very rigorous, rigorous process. It is not an easy path for the student or for the evaluator. As for recognition in the job market, the United States, like probably most other countries, loves to rank its colleges and universities. One of the pieces that makes Empire State College different is most non-traditional institutions in the United States do not have their own faculty. And Empire State College keeps its faculty, which means the curriculum is owned by the faculty, which sets it apart. I think it keeps us in a little bit of a different standard, an extra set of quality assurance, I would say, around what is taught. And that helps for our students in that regard. In the United States, though, we do have issues with students who are going to less reputable schools with very, very heavy, strong-handed recruitment tactics. And those students do often suffer where they get a degree and then they find out that the employers will not recognize that degree, which is very unfortunate and again goes back to why we have so much regulation around higher education in the United States. Uh, okay, so uh, the next question for me was asking whether our adult students are working within the same curriculum as our um, standard 18-year-olds. Um, and the answer is, the answer is that varies. Um, but what doesn't vary is that we expect them to be doing a curriculum which is appropriate to a research-intensive university. So whatever subjects they happen to be studying, and whether they're studying that wholly within the Lifelong Learning Center or mixed and shared between the Lifelong Cent Learning Center and one of our um, academic schools, or whether they are studying wholly in an academic school, the standard that we expect is uh, common across the, across the institution. But we have some programs delivered within the Lifelong Learning Center which are dedicated to the kinds of professional development that um, students come through with. So, for example, we actually have a kind of liberal arts program called Professional Studies, which gives them a diverse range of kinds of academic experience within the, uh, the broadly defined liberal arts, along with professional awareness and high, high, um, uh, high study skills and professional skills, which equips them for a wide range of, uh, of uh, opportunities when they leave us. We also have more focused programs. For example, in the UK, we have a system of teaching assistants where unqualified um, people can go into to schools, into primary and secondary schools, mainly primary schools actually, and help the qualified teachers in the classroom. And they're often, um, they're sometimes volunteers actually, um, but they have all kinds obviously of skills which we then, um, they can come to us and get um, a, a program which gives them a qualification on the basis of uh, what they've been doing in the classroom. And many of them often go on to do a teacher training course and become professional teachers. And we have a similar kind of system with healthcare assistants. So some of them are very much dedicated to the kind of, um, the kind of skill sets and experiences that students are coming through with. And in other cases, we will do a foundation year perhaps in the Lifelong Learning Center to make sure they are ready to move on to one of our academic schools and do um, more one of our more standard degree programs. Yes, I just want to add something on uh, actually uh, how to uh, effectively implement uh, lifelong learning at the university level. We need to raise awareness on the importance of lifelong learning. It's not being well received actually by many of the university leaders. Not only awareness, but also planning embedded it into university planning, budgeting for it, staffing, providing uh, staffing also, and we also need capacity building. It's not only on paper, you know, the advantage of the Republic of Korea is that you have a very strong implementation capacity, right? Many things is not only on paper, and you are, you are very good in implementing. So this is one of the strengths, and I think it's also important that for uh, lifelong learning, not to be only on paper, you need to embed this into institutional planning, and you need to budget for, for the activities, and you need to embed this into uh, as a cross-cutting uh, values and principles covering all uh, functions of universities. And then you need capacity building.
So this is, I think, it's uh, the way to implement this uh, on, uh, from theory to practice and then from paper to reality. Thank you. Um, there, was just, there was just one final question which was addressed to both myself and um, uh, Dr. Hancock, um, which is which disciplinary domains have added to recent literature on lifelong learning and participation? Um, as I said at the beginning, I'm not a, my, my area of, of scholarship and research is not education, but my understanding is that it is um, education, research in education that has uh, primarily contributed to the um, literature on lifelong learning. And of course, we must now connect that with the increasing body of uh, research that's going on on online methods of learning. Um, some of which, of course, have implications for the way we think about uh, adult learners and returners to learning, um, as well as uh, students more generally who are using online methodologies. Do you want to add to that at all? I would just echo that same piece, where we've seen the large research in the bodies of knowledge have been around education, a little bit around psychology in those areas, but largely around education. But the research really needs to be in, in the value of learning, and the ability to hold on to the knowledge and then transcend that knowledge and grow with that knowledge as, as your world changes. There are concerns about online learning. In the US, there's a lot of concerns about lecture-based learning, traditional-based learning. And we need to better understand that when we take four or more years of somebody's life and a, and a tremendous amount of resources, we need to better understand what, what is sticking, what is the value of that education and how do we deliver it? And my, my guess is in the end, we're going to end up with something that pulls on different pieces, but that's where we've seen the body of literature, where we've seen the most research. Um, is there any questions from the floor? Uh, we have uh, nine uh, questions from um, the floors and uh, I think all, uh, yeah, uh, all answers uh, will be uh, respond it. Uh, from the keynote speech yesterday, uh, Ko Chok Tong, uh, former Singapore Prime Minister, at the keynote speech, he uh, really emphasized uh, education must be linked to uh, the society and economy. And uh, he uh, underlined uh, uh, lifelong learning. Uh, finally, he suggested two alternatives uh, to respond to this kind of societal changes. Uh, he uh, suggested two alternatives. The first one is lifelong learning, and the lifelong learning must fit with the human resource uh, performance uh, to be increased. Uh, related to the keynote speeches, I have a question. So three all uh, presenters, uh, what will be uh, the university, the role and functions from the campus-based uh, uh, their uh, education for others. It doesn't matter, uh, traditional or non-traditional students. And uh, we, um, I think, assumed uh, university, the function must be changed. And what will be uh, their role and function? And uh, what's the future of university? Uh, at this point, we emphasize the uh, um, cyber education or off-campus uh, learning opportunities, uh, MOOC uh, or some uh, TED or the other kind of various uh, uh, systems offered at this point. So what will be the future of university? Is it, does it disappear at the world? I think Dr. Wong may have been close to this when he, when he talked about the various levels of education. I think the universities are going to become providers of lifelong education. We tend to think only adult students are lifelong learners, but we need to teach everyone to be a lifelong learner, both from the professional aspects of being quite comfortable coming back to learn more so people do not become outdated and find themselves where the job force has passed them by, but also 
in our very globalized, complex societies, we, and you heard the keynote speaker in the US, we love to ask questions. We love our students to ask questions. And the more we feel, the more we can get them to question something they don't understand versus close their mind to it, the more likely we are to at least understand and appreciate, even if you do not agree with a different perspective. And that's something in the United States that we know we need to work on. So I think universities are going to find themselves as providers of new knowledge and sharers of that knowledge that continue on um, throughout, throughout the lives into senior citizenry to keep our minds fresh and all of the health benefits that come at that level as well. Okay, I would, I would agree with all of that. Um, when people ask me what my role in life is as Pro Vice Chancellor of a Student Education, I say it's to try and make sure that students at Leeds, that at, at Leeds we teach our students to think so that they can go into a world where they can go on thinking. And one could obviously substitute learn and learning for those, uh, for those, uh, for think there. Um, we have to make sure as universities that our students are intellectually curious and flexible. And we have to be flexible in doing that. I don't myself think that bricks and mortar universities are under threat anytime soon. We're not about to dismantle our campus, and I'm sure most people aren't. As I said when I was giving my, my talk, um, I think education is about human beings as well as about the fantastic things that can be done technologically. But I do think that universities haven't just got to make... They cannot, we're not going to make students flexible if we're not flexible. And we have to think about the ways in which we, we deliver our courses differently. We encourage students to get out there on the net and learn from the best stuff that's out there instead of assuming we can provide it all. So it's much more about skills development, uh, mental development um, of a, a, an open-minded kind, and much less actually, I think, about sheer content. Um, and I think a lot of academics need to think very hard about that difference. I, I would like to say that uh, we need to invest on, uh, on continuing and the professional development of programs for universities. It's being regarded as actually not a major function of the universities. And professors don't like this kind of service, right? And it's also only, all, only uh, those second level professors, they are asked to do this kind of uh, uh, service. But actually, I think universities should uh, put the best resources on this to have a strong faculty of continuing and professional development. In terms of content, it's also, again, the, 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 the combination of generic skills plus professional uh, uh, knowledge and uh, skills, competencies. It's very difficult to combine these two, actually, because uh, this kind of high-order thinking skills is, is very important to make sure that uh, students can become a lifelong learner, not only with knowledge, but also with all these potentials to learn throughout their life. So this kind of uh, critical thinking, this kind of high order thinking skills are continue to be very important. And I think we also need uh, to avoid over professionalization of the undergraduate courses, uh, because that's why in the United States, they have a very strong liberal arts uh, programs, because professionalization is at the post-secondary level, right? As they are supposed to have a, uh, at post-secondary level. So don't, uh, you know, over professionalization at a very early stage to make sure that this, this person is well educated. That's education, not the training. Let them to get well educated first, then to get the training professionally. That's the way, uh, I think, for... Um, and also the modes of delivery, uh, it's, it can be flexible, uh, uh, the, the development of uh, MOOCs and also blended learning modality is also very important, I think. Thank you. Oh, he's gone. Uh, I, I just uh, acknowledge the uh, president of CADI, uh, uh, Korea Education Development Institute. Uh, I just found him and uh, uh, trying to ask uh, his opinion about the Korean situation. Is there anybody uh, to uh, respond to the same questions at the uh, uh, Korean context? 
uh, what will be uh, the future of university in Korea? Is there anybody to share idea? Okay, um, I don't want to give you some pressure. <laughs> and just to, uh, let me briefly uh, share our ideas because uh, we do the cyber or online uh, courses and especially KMOOC uh, from almost all universities just worried and asked uh, our institute to denial what will happen uh, 20 or 30 years later uh, at the university. Uh, as you mentioned, yes, I always emphasized how MOOC can contribute uh, to deliver the qualified higher educational level courses. And then they just respond to me, uh, if we do uh, what you mentioned, what must the university do? What's the role of university? And finally, who will come enter to the university gate? So do we must close our college? What was the answer? My response is no. College and university have their own role and function. And the KMOOC is the another opportunity and alternative to share for others learners, just approach to the qualified university level courses because the education is not an individual uh, priority. It's for the public. So education and learning qualified courses must be treat public goods instead of individual priority, uh, uh, property. So we can use the MOOC, KMOOC courses as textbook. The KMOOC consisted uh, frame-based, two minutes or three minutes frame-based. So anybody, it doesn't matter what's their age or what's their level uh, of school systems, they can use the frame of KMOOC contents as a textbook. That's my answer. And that's what we can imagine the future, the figure of the university and colleges. Nobody, nobody deny we must keep our learning until die, until our death. If we agree this kind of assumption we have to think about how learning and educational opportunity share with the people, especially disadvantaged, who cannot take fully their accessibility. That's our task. It's not in our domestic issues. It must be shared out of countries at the international level. I really appreciate uh, all of uh, three presenters and audience. We are very good uh, uh, discussions and it must be shared uh, with others. Thank you for your participation. Why don't you give a big claps for the presenters? Thank you.